نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم سلم وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وسهبه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, and we will continue with uh, our talk on uh, Sayyidina Ibrahim uh, and you know as we mentioned last time you know there are different aspects of his life but they all emphasize you know that character of, of uh, sacrifice as well as his status of, of reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and you know with uh, you know and doing whatever pleases his Lord you know whatever pleases Allah pleases him and we see this you know throughout his life and as we mentioned last time you know he after leaving Namrud's kingdom he stays in Canaan for, for quite a while and then ends up in Egypt uh, and then from Egypt back to Canaan uh, and by this time of course you know Bibi Sara uh, has gotten much older uh, now after he leaves Egypt along with with him is Bibi Hajra uh, who is much younger and Ibrahim al Islam has no offspring no children and he's constantly making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him a son, you know, a, a righteous son. Uh, and so uh, today, you know, I kind of intend on just kind of giving some basic background to certain things and then going into the details uh, next time, inshallah. But, uh, you know, so after a long time of not having any children with his wife, Bibi Sara, uh, she has the you know, the gift that was given to her, as, you know, in the form of Bibi Hajra when they left Egypt. And so, you know, she suggests to Ibrahim al-Islam about freeing Bibi Hajra and then Ibrahim al-Islam marrying her. Uh, and then perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them a son through her. Uh, so that at least there, there is a child within the household. And so Ibrahim al-Islam, you know, marries Bibi Hajar uh, after she's been freed. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them a son. And the son's name is, of course, Ismail al-Islam, which at literally means Allah heard. You know, it's, uh, Allah heard the prayer of Ibrahim al-Islam for a son and he granted him Ismail. Not long after Ismail al-Islam is born, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders Ibrahim al-Islam to take this child and his wife, Ibi Hajra, and leave them in the wilderness of Paran, uh, the desert wilderness of Paran. You know, and this is the wilderness literally that's around the area of Makkah. And so uh, Ibrahim al-Islam, he, he takes this, you know, his wife and child, you know, he's an obe obedient slave of Allah. You know, he submits to the will of Allah. And so he takes them without telling them where they're going or why they're going. You know, it's just time to go. And he makes this journey all the way from Canaan, hundreds of miles through the desert. And they end up in the valley of Makkah, uh, whose old name was Bakkah, uh, which is also mentioned in the Old Testament as Baka, the the the... Blessed Valley of Baca, B-A-C-A. -A. Yeah, but uh, uh, again, the old name, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions in the Quran, is Bakka. And so, he leaves them there. He goes there, 
you know, he hasn't told them where they're going, why they're going, or anything. They get there, you know, he gets off his horse, you know, gets them off their, their ride. Uh, you know, he has some dates that are remaining from the journey and some water that's remaining. He leave, gives that to them. He immediately gets on his, on his animal and starts to leave. And so, Vivi Hajara, you know, you know, we see the sacrifice of, and the reliance of Ibrahim al-Islam, but here we see this, the sacrifice and the reliance of Vivi Hajara. You know, because she is, you know, among the forefathers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, again, we have to remember that nur, that light of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, passed from a pure loin to a pure womb. And so, you know, Ibrahim al-Islam is leaving, and she sees he's leaving. She asks, where are you going? What are you doing? You know, you're abandoning us. What are you doing? And there's no response. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders him not to respond, you know, until she asks the right question. And, you know, you can imagine, and of course, you know, we shouldn't imagine them like ourselves because they are not like ourselves. But we should also put ourselves in that position to learn from the situation and to learn their, to try to try to understand their status and their understanding. You know, she knows that her husband is is the messenger of Allah. You know? And so when she asks him, you know, what why are you leaving us here? And she gets no response, she knows what to ask next. Of course, if it was us, you know, we'd be screaming and ranting and raving and doing whatever else. So she asked him, she says, Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to do this? And he nods in the affirmative and she says, Then fine. Then you go, because the one who has ordered you to leave us here will never abandon us. So he continues on. And he comes to a certain point, you know, he, he left them there, uh, you know, he left, you know, and there's nothing there, I mean, there's nothing there, literally nothing there, you know, except for the foundations of the Kaaba, and you can't even see that properly. And so as he's leaving, you know, in Surah Ibrahim, verse number 37, you know, we see what Ibrahim al-Islam says in the dua that he makes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, and if you read the verse, you know, Roughly, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, uh, you know, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, indeed I have left some of my offspring in this uh, uncultivated or, or valley without any vegetation next to your house. Which again tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's house was already there. He says, next to your house. Mm -hmm. So that they may establish salat. So, O oh my Lord, incline people's hearts toward them and, and give them fruits to eat so that they may be grateful. So he makes this dua and then he continues his journey back. And he ends up, he goes back to, to Canaan and we'll get back to this point later. But uh, in the meantime, you know, he left them with what? You know, a few dates and a little bit of water. How long is that going to last in the desert? You, know, you have a small baby who's still nursing. You know, mother, she runs out of food. And what happens? There's nothing to drink, there's nothing to eat. It's just pure desert. Nothing but sand. You know, sand and hills. And so when they run out of provisions, and it, it's, Ismail al-Islam, of course, is crying. So she starts wondering what to do. So she, there's a hill close by called Safa. And she goes up that, you know, to see if maybe she can see at the distance if maybe somebody is coming. So she can ask for something. And when she doesn't see anybody here, she goes, she runs down. She's looking, constantly looking at her son. You know, she's constantly looking at Ismail al-Islam. Uh, to make sure that he's still okay. And so she comes down, 
And then she gets to a point where she walks down the hill and she's walking toward the next hill, which is Marwa. And she gets to a point where now there's a dip and she can't see her child anymore. Yeah. And so at this point she runs until she comes up to uh, high enough to now where she can see her child again. And she goes up Marwa and she looks around and she doesn't see anybody there either. So now she starts coming down. Going back towards Safa, maybe somebody's coming, you know, the thought comes in, well, maybe somebody's coming from the other side now. And the same thing. And she repeats this process seven times, running back and forth in the heat of the desert, constantly looking at her son. And then finally, on that seventh trip, back and forth, back to Marwa. You know, she looks back and she sees from, from her son where her son is, you know, rubbing his heels on the sand. You know, this spring of water gushing out. You know, so she comes running and it's coming out so fast that she starts making a barrier around it, trying to keep it from going anywhere else. And she starts saying, zum, 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 you know, stop, stop. And finally the water stops, stays within the boundaries that she has built around it. And, and she's drinking from this and the child is drinking from this, quenching their thirst and their hunger. You know, Rasulullah Sussum said about Zamzam, he said one, he said that if she had not ordered it to stop, then it would be flowing in the house of every believer. You know, and if you, you can think about it even today, you know, this well in the middle of the desert, you know, where you can't find any water. You know, they start digging wells and they hit rock or they hit oil. You know. And yet it supplies the water for all of, uh, of Mecca and it's even taken to Medina Munawara and taken here and there. And, it's, and the and people for Hajj, uh, come for Hajj, they take that water throughout the world. People are coming from Umrah taking that water. And yet it never dries up. And he also said that Zamzam is not only water, but it is also food. You know, it will suffice you as food. You can live off of it. Uh, Abu Dhar al-Fari, when he came to meet Rasulullah he stayed there 17 days before he could eventually meet Rasulullah uh, He lived off of nothing but Zamzam. Other companions, when Rasulullah told them that this is also food, they started drinking nothing but Zamzam for 30 days and they gained weight. This is the barakah or the blessing from the rubbing of the heel of Ismail. Yeah. Now, if we look at this action, you know, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved the action of Bibi Hajra so much so that He has ordered this for everyone who comes for Umrah and for everyone who comes for Hajj. You know, this is an ibadah, this is the worship of Allah because we are emulating the slave of Allah. The one that he loved. If you look at ibadah in Islam, every form of worship is connected to one of the lovers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, it doesn't matter what form of worship you look at. You know, Hajj is a simple example of this. And we'll talk more about this as we talk about you know, the life of Ibrahim al -Islam and Ismail al -Islam. But Hajj is a very simple example of this. But every form of worship, whether it's Salat, you know, Hajj, all of the aspects of Hajj, you know, fasting, uh, everything that we do, that we say is the worship of Allah, is in some way connected to the ones that Allah subhanahu wa loves. And we simply emulate them, and Allah subhanahu wa says that this is my worship. Yeah. And so, the same thing here. You know, this is something that continue, has continued on from that time and will continue on until you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Qiyam. You know, until there is no more uh, earth. This will continue on. And so, and of course, after this, you know, they, she sets the boundaries and the well is there now, or rather the spring is there. 
about this same time, you have tribes in Yemen that are leaving Yemen and coming north you know, because of environmental changes and situations there. And one of these tribes happens to be the tribe of Jurham, uh, which was an Arab tribe. Uh, and they, were, they had left Yemen moving north with the plan of uh, settling somewhere in northern Arabia. But as they're passing by this area, they see birds flying overhead. You know, and these birds should not be there unless there is water there. And they, of course, knew of no water source there. You know, because there wasn't any water there before. So they send some men ahead to go and take a look. You know. And when they eventually they arrive there at, at, at this spring, they see Bibi Hajar al-Islam, she's sitting there. Uh, next to the well, and they realize that this is hers. So they come respectfully. You know, she of course hasn't seen any human face other than her child's face in such a long time. She's pleased to see them as well, and they're pleased to see her that there's water there. And they ask if they can, and they ask her permission to be able to use the water. And they take the water and they go back to their tribe and they say, "Yeah, you know, there's water here, and let's go." So they all come. The whole tribe comes, and she. Uh, they ask permission from her, you know, they're so respectful of her, they ask, and this is part of the dua of Ibrahim al-Islam, that may, uh, he says, oh Allah, uh, incline people's hearts towards them. And they ask her permission, and she gives them permission to, 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 to encamp there, and then eventually to settle there, that's where they settled. And so this tribe will, is the tribe that Ismail al-Islam will grow up with, you know, it's the Arab tribe of Jurham. Ibrahim al-Islam, in the meantime, comes back and forth, making trips, you know, to meet the family, going back to his wife Bibi Sara in Canaan, and then eventually coming, and there are reports that he would come back and forth on a burak. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a burak so it would make his trip easier. Not the same burak that Rasulullah Sussam rode in Miraj, but a burak from Jannah. Uh, and so, you know, otherwise you're talking, you know, couple of months journey one way and each way and then going back and forth, you know, would be a hardship on Ibrahim alayhi you know. And so, inshallah, I will end here with this today. Uh, we'll continue and as I said, I'll fill in some of the other gaps uh, as we come back to some other aspects and also expound upon, you know, the aspect of Ismail al Islam and Bibi Hajar and, and, and Zamzam as well, inshallah. You know, allow us to understand and give us guidance and fill our hearts with His true love. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa ala Muhammad wa ala ala salli ala Sayyidina wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Oh Allah, guide us through the straight path and fill our hearts with Your love and the love of Your beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family, his companions and all of those whom You love. Uh, and uh, uh, allow us in this month of Ramadan to, uh, to uh, uh, understand uh, the maqam or the status of your beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all of those who are close to him all of the anbiya, all of the prophets and those who are close to them and uh, send peace and serenity upon those uh, among the ummah of Rasulullah who are being oppressed throughout the world whether it's in Palestine or Kashmir or Burma or, or any other place uh, and uh, Allow us to come back to you, to make tawbah to you, because this is the only way that we can get out of, uh, or get, uh, save ourselves from your wrath. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayr khalqihi Muhammadin wa alihi wa sallam ya rahmatullahi wa